more than 10 years experience in her field. She's going to be talking about a galaxy of her own. So let's welcome her to the stage, Dr. Libby Jackson. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Wow, what an honor to be here. Thank you. First up, I'm not a doctor. I, I shouldn't take credit for that, but I am a human spaceflight expert, I, expert. I've been working in the field for well over 10 years, and it has been my lifelong passion. Ever since I was a little girl, the moon, the stars, the, the astronauts have been something that just captured my imagination. And I've been really, really fortunate to get a job working in human spaceflight, but I have done nothing more than just follow my passions and my dreams and go after them. And so I wrote a book, and it's called A Galaxy of Her Own, Amazing Stories of Women in Space. There will be copies on sale afterwards, and I'll be signing them for anyone who would like a copy. So do stick around if you can. But, oh, he's over there. There's a, uh, over there in the corner, stage right. But why did I write this book? I'm guessing the pictures you can see behind me. Certainly you know the guy on the right. You probably know of the name of the guy in the middle, I'm sure. And you might know of the name of the guy on the left. From left to right, they are Yuri Gagarin, who was the first human in space. Neil Armstrong, who 49 years ago today was the first human to walk on the moon. And Tim Peake, the second British astronaut in space. Names everybody knows. Names that everybody should know. But there are so many women who we don't know the names of. Everybody thinks of space as a male-dominated field, and it still is. It's changing, but it still is. And so it's really, really important that we celebrate all the fantastic women who have been a part of all of these missions and continue to be so today so that we can all understand and learn that space is a field for everybody to get involved in and redress that balance. So I'm going to take you through the story of human spaceflight and share a few stories that hopefully you don't know. So way back on the 4th of October, 1957, Ah, the clicker's gone nuts. They warned me about this. Whoa, okay. Okay, I think we're good. Way back on the 4th of October, 1957, Sputnik became the first satellite to go into space. It was launched by the Soviet Union. The space age had begun. The space age started out as a race between the Soviet Union and the United States of America. And with Sputnik, America was suddenly on the back foot. They needed to get a satellite in space. And so they had all the cameras there. They were, had the Vanguard ready to go. And ah, it's not me, I swear. Every time I click it once, let's go back. Ah, sorry, technical hitches. There we go. And on the 6th of December, 1957, that happened. Big boom didn't go well. And the whole world had tuned in to watch this huge embarrassment. America's first attempt to get a satellite into space failed miserably. So the Americans were rushing. This was just before NASA was created, and so there still wasn't um, their space agency. And the Army had a rocket they could get into space. Now, the space race had been born out of World War II. Werner von Braun was a German rocket scientist. He designed the V-2 bomb that, that rained down uh, across the UK and, and caused untold destruction. Rather than being a, a prisoner of war, he, the Americans could see that space would be this frontier and they needed his, um, his expertise. So they brought him over to America. He became an American citizen and they started putting his wonderful engineering skills to a much more peaceful use. He had a rocket that was ready to go and a satellite that could get it into space. But the rocket wasn't quite powerful enough. He needed a more powerful fuel. So he, he said to the government, look, we can do this, but we're going to need a more powerful fuel. So what Werner von Braun did uh, and his military uh, colleagues was they went to a company called North American Aviation. They were the world of the American leaders in explosives and munitions and rocket fuel. And they said, we need new rocket fuel. Give us your best man for the job. 
And the bosses had a whole book of, of all the CVs and things, and they turned to a page and they said, you need Mary. You need Mary Sherman Morgan. And, and the bosses looked at this and they went, it's a woman. Worse, the woman has not even been to university. No, 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 we want a man, we want a man. And the bosses said, no, no, trust us, you want Mary. Mary was an amazing chemist, but she'd grown up on a farm in North Dakota. And uh, as a young girl, she had to be taken basically away from home by the social services and sent to school because her parents needed her and wanted her to attend the farm. She loved school, she loved learning, she was brilliant at chemistry, so she ran away from home to go off to university. But while she was there, World War II broke out, and she basically was uh, summoned because of her amazing skills to a, a top secret job. She decided to leave her degree, get this job, which was making munitions for the war, and that led to her working in North American aviation. She was the only female in 900 engineers but it didn't phase her and she worked well and she was clearly hugely, hugely talented and that was how she came to be uh, recommended as the person who should design this new rocket fuel. Werner von Braun and the military relented. Mary designed a new rocket fuel, it was called Hydine. And on the 31st of January, 1958, Explorer 1 was launched into orbit on a Jupiter C rocket and the US were part of the space race. And that story of Mary was nearly lost forever. She retired not long after this success, brought up a family, and because of the sort of top secret nature, she just really didn't talk about her work at all. It was only after she died that her son started finding out about what she'd done and talking to her friends and uncovered this amazing story. If it hadn't been for Mary, the US wouldn't have joined the space race when they did. We're, so we should just celebrate her work and, and learn about Mary Sherman Morgan. She's just the first of, of many other stories still to come. After the satellites, the space race developed, and we got to sending humans into space. And on the 12th of April, 1961, Yuri Gagarin became the first human in space. They got there, they, they got there um, first. The Soviet Union understood the, the, the benefit of that propaganda of those firsts. And so after the first man in space, they wanted to get the first woman in space. Now, the Soviets were flying a spacecraft called Vokshod, Vostok, Vostok. And uh, it couldn't land on Earth. In order to, uh, to safely go into space and get out again, you had to get out of this spacecraft uh, a little while, a few kilometers in the air, and parachute back to Earth whilst the spacecraft went and crash landed. And so the Soviets were looking for female parachutists, and they found Valentina Tereshkova. Valentina wanted to be a train driver when she was young. She would see the trains going into Moscow. She thought that looked like fun. She wanted a fun, amazing, adventurous job, and that was what led her to learn how to parachute. She wanted some adventure. She was plucked from there, but again, it was top secret. They said, no, come and train as a cosmonaut, but you can't tell anyone. She couldn't even tell her mother, Elena. She would send letters back to her mother, telling her all about what she was doing in the national parachuting team. That was the, the story she had told them. So when, uh, on the 16th of June, 1963, she went into space, the first woman in space, her mother had no idea. It wasn't until the neighbors ran around to Elena's house and said that, your daughter, your daughter, she, she's in space. Um, Elena said to her, no, 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 look, I've got letters from her. She, she's away, she's learning to parachute. She's not in space. They said, no, no, come and see, come and see. She walked around their house, she saw her daughter on television, and Valentina Tereshkova, her daughter, was the first woman in space. A name that we should never forget. But Valentina's flight was not without problems. The engineers had loaded the software incorrectly, and she noticed while she was in space that this spacecraft rather than returning safely to Earth, was programmed to go further out into space, leading her to just die slowly in space. She noticed it, she got the engineers to fix it, they sent up some code to the spacecraft, she returned safely to Earth. She noticed it. But everybody basically blamed all of the mission's problems on Valentina. She was a woman, she was the one, it would be a woman's fault, could not possibly be any of the male engineers. And they lived with that knowledge for 30 years until they finally said, okay, it was our fault. 
Valentina took the rap. She knew that that was the way it needed to be. She knew that it was important for the Soviet Union to present a united front. But now we all know better. Valentina was a wonderful, wonderful cosmonaut, and her name should be remembered. The Americans, whilst Yuri and Valentina were heading into space, hired their own astronauts. This is the Mercury 7, group, the first uh, group of uh, American US astronauts. And they were all uh, chosen because they were test pilots. And test pilots in America at the time were all male and they were nearly, nearly all white. So you've got seven male white test pilots. But they were chosen uh, because they were test pilots. They were also put through the most monumental set of medical tests because we didn't know what was going to happen to humans when we sent them into space that first time. So we wanted a human that was as per physically perfect as could possibly be to, so that they could handle whatever might happen and should anything go wrong, they could deal with it. They had uh, a guy called Randy Lovelace, a doctor, was the person who put all of them through the tests, and he was curious to see if women could stand up to the same uh, rigors. And so one day, he met Jerry Cobb. Jerry is an amazing pilot, was an amazing pilot. She'd been uh, flying airplanes as a demonstrator. Back in the 50s when she was flying, there weren't very many pilots at all. And as soon as Jerry and Randy met, they thought, perfect. So Jerry, when asked, do you want to go through these tests? Of course, of course. She found another 19 women, and they all went through the same set of medical tests that those Mercury 7 had been through to see how they would do. The women did just as well. In some cases, they did better. And the doctors noted that, in general, the women didn't complain as much and could withstand a lot more pain than the men. They did very, very well. They proved that they were absolutely just as capable of going into space as the men. Some people, including Randy Lovelace, saw that this was the first in a sequence of, of getting these women into space that they might be astronauts. And the astronauts were called fellow lady astronaut trainees. But the program wasn't a NASA program. And as NASA's focus became more about getting to the moon, Lyndon B. Johnson, in the end, who, who wasn't president at the time, but was responsible for, for looking after the space affairs, in the end, he wrote a memo and said, this has to stop now. He saw women as a distraction. We don't need to send women into space. And so sadly, in the Apollo and the early days of American space flight, there were no women in space. As I said, everybody was focused on getting to the moon. This is the Saturn V rocket that took them there. But whilst no women went to the moon, they certainly, the astronauts who got there, certainly didn't get there without the women. They were, they were in all the roles right throughout it. And there's a couple I which we'll pick up on just now. The first is Margaret Hamilton. It's a photograph you might have seen. She has become a bit of a, a poster child for the Apollo days. It's a very famous photo of her standing next to that stack of, of um, code. <clears throat> but when I started researching the book, I knew of that picture. But some people, I think, were presenting it as, as she was the token woman. They're working on the code and, and, and just sort of there to say, hey, look, we're not just men. What I discovered and I didn't realize is that not only did Margaret write it, Margaret was the lead. She was in charge of the whole team that wrote the software that got Apollo to the moon. She coined the term software engineering. She invented this job. She loved maths. She went off to study maths at uh, MIT in, in America. And as uh, she started sort of hearing that they would be recruiting people to go to get write the software to go to the moon, she said, that's what I want to do. She, she made sure she found out about the jobs. She applied for them. She got them. She was in charge of the team. Whilst it was a really, really hard job, they'd never done it before. They, no one had sent humans to the moon. They had to learn on the fly and work out what was what. So she was working long hours, but she made sure to try and spend as much time with her daughter, Lauren, as possible. And so one day, Lauren came to work with her often in the evenings and the weekends. And one day, Lauren was, was playing with the, the mock-up of the code that uh, they had. And Lauren, her daughter, managed to basically crash the code. And so Margaret said, oh, that's not good. And she rang NASA up and she worked out what happened. And she said, I want to make sure this can't happen again. I need to put a, a fix in the code. And NASA said, no, 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 it's fine. Astronauts won't make the same mistakes as your small daughter. 
Lo and behold, on, uh, I think it was Apollo 8, as uh, Jim Lovell and Bill Anders and co were heading to the moon, um, this, they made the same prompt mistake, crashed the computer. The astronauts do make the same mistakes as the young children. Margaret had to go down to mission control and fix the code. It was fine. That aside, from what I understand, the software worked perfectly. Uh, there were no issues. It got everybody safely to the moon and back. And as I say, Margaret was in charge of writing the whole thing. The software that they wrote for the Apollo guidance computer then uh, got into the Skylab um, software, the, the American software. It's even in some aeroplane, the basis of it is in some aeroplane software now. So her contributions are all around the world, keeping us all in the sky. The code that she wrote was really complicated and it had to be programmed into a computer. Now computers back in the 60s weren't like the mobile phones that we're all standing around now that we could drop and you know, even get wet. Hard disks were really, really, really delicate. There was no way they were gonna withstand the vibrations of a launch to get into space. And so the engineers realized that they were going to need to come up with a design to, base, to really hardwire this code. And they had a, a concept of using wire and rings to, to, to physically code the ones and the zeros that make up computer code. In order to do that, they were going to need some really talented, dexterous people, and they turned to the women of Waltham, Massachusetts, who made watches. These were the women, and they were the people they employed to, to make this hardware. And you can see them sitting here. Two women would sit either side. They would feed thin copper wire through and around these, these rings, if you went around the outside, it was a one. If you went through the middle, it was a zero. You wove the whole thing together, piece by piece by piece, and you turned Margaret's code in, in ones and zeros into the physical disk. It took months. It was real, really painstaking work. These women were so important that when they had nothing to do, they were still paid to sit there just in case they were needed. There was no one else who could do the job as well as they could. They were termed the little old ladies up there in Walthamstow, or well, Waltham, sorry, by uh, the engineers. But it was a complete misnomer. They weren't little, they weren't old, they were you know, professional women who knew that what they were doing. And they knew that their hard work was going to take people to the moon and it needed to be right. If they made an error, it could take weeks to unpick it. Their work worked perfectly. When Apollo 12 was on its way to the moon, it was struck by lightning. It crashed the computers, the whole thing shut down. Because it was all hard-coded into this thing properly, you couldn't erase the memory. The rocket, as it was racing through the air, restarted, it was absolutely fine, and headed off to the moon. In the book, there's a lovely illustration of everybody, which I should say has been done by the students at London College Communications, and there's a quote. And I wanted to include a quote from everybody. But these women have been lost in history. I was spent weeks trying to find anybody, any names I could, just to find out who they were. Raytheon, the people they were working for, have got, said, no, they've even got a note on their website. We don't do historical things anymore. They're not interested. I put shout outs out. I spoke to all my contacts throughout the world of human spaceflight, and nobody, no one could tell me their names. Right at the end, just before the book went to print, I finally unearthed an old BBC interview, and there was one line from somebody called Mary Lou Rogers, and she is the only name I've been able to find. There's YouTube videos of all these women in the background and the men talking there. They have been completely lost to history, and without their hard work, their contributions, their dedication, we would not have got to the moon. And so it's really, really sad that we don't know who they are, but they are just one part of so many other things that has been going on across the world of human spaceflight. From Apollo, we sort of got into the shuttle era. And as the America got ready to launch the shuttles, they knew that finally they were going to need some women and some people from different backgrounds, just not white male test pilots to fly this thing. And so they started looking for new astronauts. And that's where Nichelle Nichols comes in. You will, may well know Nichelle Nichols as Lieutenant Uhura from the Star Trek series. She broke boundaries, broke down barriers in her acting career. But she used that platform to then challenge NASA. She could see that her space race, this, this new thing, sci-fi and space, sits alongside each other always. Just didn't look like her, didn't look like the America she, she could see. And so she challenged NASA and said, you need to hire some other people and I'm going to help you. 
This was back in the 70s. And they said, sure, come along and help. And, and she did, but she said, look, I am going to go from school to school and find you the very best candidates. And if you don't hire them because of what they look like or who they are, even when they're qualified, the whole world would know about it. So Nichelle was true to her word. She didn't just do a few television pieces. She went from school to school. She went and met the engineers. She really, really, really worked hard to make sure that as many people as possible knew what they could do and that they could apply. And she was successful. When the 1978 class was announced, there were six women in it and four people from uh, ethnic and minority backgrounds. Nichelle didn't stop there. You can see from this photo, it's a, it's a recent photo. She has been working with NASA ever since to continue to try and make sure that everybody understands that the space industry is somewhere that everybody is welcome and can work. And her work is outstanding. Just goes to show you that sci-fi and science, they really do come and, and meet in the place called space, and it's wonderful. Now, one of the people that Nichelle was able to speak to and, and to encourage to apply and who was selected was Sally Ride. Sally was the first US woman in space. She was uh, selected in 1978 and she flew in 1983. She was a hugely private individual. She was very focused. And when she was assigned to her flight, she really just wanted to do her job properly. The media really focused on the fact she was going to be the first woman in space. They asked her all sorts of questions. How are you gonna do your hair? What's it like? How's it feel? Questions they just weren't asking her male colleagues, and she got so frustrated and said, look, just I'm an astronaut, I've just been selected to do my job, would you let me get on with it? But after her flight, Sally saw how much her breaking down that barrier meant to women and, and, and underrepresented people around the world, and she started to understand what, what it meant and, and what it meant to them. And from that point on, she really has gone after it, and she wanted to make sure that uh, young children, uh, young people in particular, would see that. So she worked tireless, tirelessly through her life uh, to encourage people to join the space industry. She died in 2012 from pancreatic cancer. And her story had another twist in the tale. I've known Sally all, all, all my career. She's always been there. She's a name a lot of people know. And when she died in 2012, her obituary was published by her partner, Tam O'Shaughnessy, a female. They'd been living together, they'd been uh, in a partnership for, for years and years and years. It was never a thing, no one ever knew about it. But Sally had never come out as gay when she was an astronaut because she felt not able to. When I read this, I thought, wow, I didn't know that about Sally. But surely, okay, that's you know, 2018 now, these things aren't a problem. You look around, Sally is the only openly gay astronaut. It's an area that we just haven't sort of covered. The industry yet isn't there. And so I just, I like to mention that just to show you that there's still things to do. I can't believe in the 550 people who have been into space, she's the only gay person at all. So I'd love for the, everybody to become more open and, and still sort of continue to celebrate the things that we knew less about Sally for and, and see the industry for something still inclusive for everybody. Sally flew in 1983 but she wasn't the first woman to fly after Valentina Tereshkova. The Soviets ever on the, an eye on the prize for the, um, uh, for the propaganda could see what NASA were doing. They could see that they were going to have another woman in space. And they had their Salyut 7 space station. And so they decided to fly another woman, Sav oh, Svetlana Savitskaya, a name, again, that I had never heard of until I was researching my book, which is really sad because she's brilliant. Not only was she the second woman in space, she was an amazing fighter pilot. She'd flown MiG planes, again was selected for her ability to, to withstand the, the rigors of space. And uh, she was a parachutist uh, and the world aerobatic champion. She flew to upstage Sally and then as um, uh, America were getting ready to send Catherine Sullivan into space to be the first uh, spacewalk, female spacewalking for the Americans. They sent Svetlana back again to do a spacewalk, just to upstage her. So she was the first woman ever to do a spacewalk. And I say just to upstage, it's so sad, really, that that's why Russia were choosing to fly her. She was a superb pilot, absolutely brilliant. But she again had to suffer such sexist views. When she got 
um, to Mir, to the space station. Her um, cosmonaut colleagues up there basically said, there's the kitchen, here's an apron. Off you go, you're preparing a dinner. And Svetlana was brilliant. She was very cool, she couldn't be flanked. She said, hey, I thought you were going to do that. But she suffered from that the whole way through her flight and she came back. Just because the Soviets, perhaps at the time, didn't understand quite how women should be treated and how much, how equal they should be and are in, in terms of space, doesn't mean we should forget about Svetlana. So I really like to mention her because I'd never heard of her. So hopefully now we might all know that the first woman to do a spacewalk was Svetlana Savitskaya. I mentioned the Mir space station there. That was the, the follow-on to Salyut. Beautiful, beautiful space station. The first woman to visit the Mir space station wasn't a Russian. Svetlana visited Salyut. The first woman to visit Mir was Helen Sharman, our first British astronaut. Not only was she the first British astronaut, not only she wasn't the first woman, British woman astronaut, she was the first British astronaut. She was the first woman to go to the Mir space station. Tim has had and is having a wonderful career, and quite rightly so. His mission has been hugely celebrated and been a wonderful, wonderful inspiration to, to young people particularly. But some of the media really did seem to forget that Helen had ever flown, and that's really sad, so I always like to point her out and redress it. Helen answered an advert. She, was, she didn't fly as a government astronaut. It was a private endeavor, but she didn't buy a ticket. It was really sort of the early days of reality TV. A, a, a consortium of British companies decided we should get an astronaut into space from the UK. There was a Russian seat available that they could pay for. They ran a whole selection uh, campaign uh, that who was going to go over to Russia for training was announced from the Science Museum. And it was announced to be between Helen Sharman and another Tim called Tim Mace. And they headed over to Russia for final training. And Helen really at that point assumed she was never going to go because she was a woman. And you're going over to Russia and we've just spoken about the views that they have. And so she was flabbergasted when just about eight weeks before the flight, she was finally picked and she flew. She spent eight days in space. She did a brilliant mission on Mir. She carried out science experiments. She did photography. But what Helen would say is that she never thought she would go to space because she was ordinary. She just answered an advert. But it is her ordinary, ordinary, ordinary qualities, you'd say, team working, being able to work hard. These are the things that made her a good astronaut. And so Helen really, really is the perfect example. And what she would like to say, if, if she can do it, anyone can, because she's, she's just an ordinary person. It takes nothing away from Helen. Just goes to show anyone, anyone could do it if they get the right opportunity at the right time. Which brings us up to date to today, the International Space Station. That's where Tim headed off to. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And again, could not be up in space without hundreds and hundreds of people from all sorts of different backgrounds. And I want to share the story of one person in particular. It's a lady called Ginger Carrick. I spent seven years working in mission control and say I dreamed of being a flight director and I was lucky enough to do it. And so Ginger really has, in my opinion, the best job in the world. She's a flight director for the International Space Station. But Ginger dreamed of being an astronaut. She, when she was about five or six, she remembers the book where she saw the astronaut on the cover and she said, that's what I want to do. She wrote to NASA, they said, work hard, study science, be part of a team. She did all of that. And as soon as she could, she got a, a graduate job. She worked from NASA from the day she could get a job. And then, as soon as she had all the right qualifications, she applied to be an astronaut. And she, she got through the first selection round. She got down to about the last 100, and she could see, oh, wow, this is, this is really good. Her day job at the time was, was training astronauts. She did really, really well until she got to the medical tests. Now, still, when we send people into space, we want to make sure that they're fit and healthy. Medical emergencies in space are a really bad thing, and you want to avoid them at all costs, because to bring an astronaut back at the, when you're not planning to is, is risky, ends the mission. It, it, it's not a good idea unless you really, really have to do it. And as Ginger went through all of this training, she discovered that she had kidney stones. And that was it. She was out. She was never going to be an astronaut. Kidney stones are, are not fatal. She didn't even know she had them, but 
why send somebody into space with kidney stones when there are other equally qualified people? Because they, they might turn into something, they might give you complications. And Ginger was devastated. How was she going to go back to work and start working alongside all the crew who, who she trained every day? She cried. She was, she was devastated, but she gave herself a talking to, and she said, if, if I'm training all these astronauts to go into space, then a little bit of me is going to go because they've all got to come through me. And she took that confidence and, and went with it. One day, they were needing some people to go and train in Russia as we got ready for the International Space Station, and Ginger said, I'll go. I'm, a, I'm an instructor. And so she went. She was selected. She basically did her astronaut training alongside all of them. And when she came back, she used that expertise to say, I should be CAPCOM. CAPCOM is the capsule communicator. It's the person in mission control who talks to the spacecraft. And up to this point, it had only ever been astronauts. Astronauts talking to astronauts, that they think the same language, they speak the same way. And so you know, that's why you put an astronaut in that chair. But we were going to be doing 24 hour seven operations for the space station. There weren't enough, enough astronauts to go around. And so Ginger said, look, I've had all this astronaut training. I've been alongside. I'd be perfect at this. And Ginger became the first non-astronaut Capcom in mission control. And from your seat in mission control in Capcom, the person who sits next to them is flight director. And she saw what the flight director did, running the mission, solving the problems, steering the ship, keeping an eye on everything. She knew that that was the job for her. She went for it, and this time she got it, and she's been there ever since. Ginger, when, when, when you listen to her speak, she says she's really happy that her life didn't plan out the way it is, or it, she hoped. There were bumps in the road, she took stock, she went around them. Over 500 people have been into space. Less than 100 have ever sat in the flight director chair. So she's even more special than the astronauts now, and I completely agree with her that she has the best job in the world, and she wouldn't have it any other way, so she's really quite happy her life didn't work out quite as planned. That's today. The future and space is changing. There's now a third nation that's actually launched their own people into space on their own spacecraft, and that's the Chinese. And Liu Yang was the first Chinese female Taikonaut. I mentioned the selection process earlier uh, for the Mercury 7. What the Chinese had to go through was even more crazy. Not only did she have to be a perfect physical specimen, she could have no scars, no tattoos, her family history had to be correct, she had to have the right accent, she was absolutely perfect. We know very little about Lu. She's flown in space once, but the Chinese still keep a lot of things to themselves. But China are there as a world player. They have a space station. They've got a second one now. Hopefully, perhaps, we'll see Lu fly to it one day. And they're talking about going to the moon and Mars. And it's a really exciting time with all these players. And where we are thinking now for the future of human space flight is Mars. That's where we're pointing to. That's what we're thinking about. It's a really, really exciting time now. The space station is there, but the European Space Agency and NASA and the other international partners around the world are talking now about the Gateway, a very small space station out near the moon where we could start learning how to live and work in space. We'll go there for 30 or 60 days at a time. It's going to be a really harsh radiation environment, but from there we will be able to send missions back down to the moon and then get ready for going on to Mars. And we will, I am certain now, see people get to Mars within the lifetime of the young people. And I hope in my life, if I live to a, a ripe old age, I am convinced that we will see humans there. But that endeavor now isn't just going to be national space agencies. Commercial space flight is really starting to take to it. And one of the big names that you will have heard of, if you've seen the cherry red Tesla that went into space, you will have heard of SpaceX. You may not have heard of Gwynne Shotwell. Gwynne Shotwell is the chief operating officer of SpaceX. She sits under Elon Musk, and she is really making all of that happen. All of those rockets, everything that you see happens, Gwynne is at the top of that tree. Elon's out there tweeting and, and being the brains. Gwynne's doing all the hard work. She's always been an engineer. She started in space industry companies and then got into management, and she uh, worked for SpaceX and has just worked her way up and through it. She was, was she liked space and engineering as a kid, but she thought it might be a bit geeky. She wasn't sure it would be her. She wasn't sure it was cool. And then one day, her mum took her along to a, a STEM event, 
She started meeting engineers just like everybody out there today can go and meet all the wonderful engineers and scientists who are out in all the different fields. And Gwyn met a female. And she saw that this was something she could do. It wasn't a, a, a non-call job. And she's now COO of arguably the coolest space industry company that there is. Everybody knows who SpaceX is now. And she's a part of it. And SpaceX have said they want to get humans to the moon and Mars. SpaceX will be a part of it. It will be part of NASA. There are other companies out there like Blue Origin and, and so on. And we are going to get to Mars. All of those women have been a part of that story. My message to you is that all of you can be a part of this. The first person on Mars is alive today. Could be one of the young people in this room. It, it really, really could. To get there is going to need a mass effort. It's going to need people from across the industry. You've seen that it's not just the astronauts. There are lawyers, there are medics, there are doctors, there are seamstresses, there are watchmakers, there are communications people. There are, there are all sorts of different people getting involved, and they will all come together to get us to Mars. Whatever it is you enjoy doing, whatever your passion in life is, go and do it. All of these women I've been talking about got to do their jobs because they found something that they enjoyed doing, and they didn't let anyone tell them they couldn't do it. They've come from a whole different series of times where women's roles have been different and they're evolving. Whatever it is you enjoy, just go for it. Don't let anybody else tell you can. If you want to come and be a part of the space industry and the part of Mars, we would love to have you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. We've got, I think, time for perhaps one or two questions. Uh, so if you have any, there's a roving microphone out there somewhere. Have we, have we got some time? Yeah. So stick your hand up, wave at someone with a microphone, and I'd be delighted to answer them. But I can't see you out there. So there's a, there's a hand up there. There's one at the back. There's, there's, there's one in the middle. Oh, there's so, so many. Um, oh, I have to pick one now. I have to pick one. Actually, maybe one of the people I haven't mentioned and I should have done. There's in the book, there's, there's not one woman, but there's a group of women. And I've, I've picked out the Mercury 7 wives, who were the wives of those Mercury 7 astronauts I talked about. But they're in there because they represent the support that everybody has within the industry. All of the people there all of the astronauts who go into space, they do it because they have people around them who are supporting them as well. And that's a really, really important part of the story as well. No one makes it on their own. There's always a husband or a wife or a partner or a friend or, or a daughter or a son helping them keep going. And that's really important too. So, so go after your own dreams and support your others as, as your friends as well. Let's see. You got another question? Yeah, at the back. Hopefully. Yeah, it's on. This has become a real passion of mine recently. We have a very leaky pipeline for, from the youngest people. We see people dropping out every step along the way. And where I truly believe at the minute we can make the biggest difference is by changing society and changing the conversation. I have a young niece, and, and it's watching her that has, has really got me so het up about this. She's just, this has just come to the end of her first year at school. She has loved football, cars, space, rockets, all sorts of things, all through her life, and she's been brought up in a family where we just get on and everybody's free to do whatever they want. Her cousin loves dancing and princesses and all the rest of it. it it's just, you know, they find their own way in life. As soon as she has got to school, she has suddenly learned that what she likes is for boys. 
And that's not through her teacher, that's just through her friends, through, through, through toy boxes. Through, that she went to her school fair and there was a girls and a boys tombola and she's suddenly understanding that, that these interests are, are, are boys' interests. Now, we will encourage her and we will say, no, you have to be strong and you have to keep going. But she's going to have to fight that now. And she might have the courage and the strength and belief to do that. She might not. And there will be other girls in the class who maybe not. There will be boys in that class who enjoy being creative, who enjoy dancing or theater or caring or want to be a nurse and are suddenly learning that they're not for them. And that's what we have to change. If we can do outreach to help teachers and professionals understand the power they have to try and treat young people equally, to help them see that there are no girls' jobs or boys' jobs. Everybody can go and do whatever they want, regardless of any label that, that society puts on them, whether that's gender or race or background or upbringing or disability or the color of your hair, whatever it is, it's got nothing to do with what you can and should do and go for it. So that, for me, is, is really the message that I hope that any outreach can do and that we can do so much more and that we can encourage everybody to, to follow their dreams and their passions. <laughs> right, we've got one more question, I think. Last question. And I can see a hand over on that side. There's one in the middle. Just, yeah. say is that whatever age, whatever your skill set, whatever your background, there will be a job for you. You sometimes have to do some work to go and bash down those doors. But, and whether that's in space or whether that's in, in whatever else you're interested in, there are so many jobs in the world. You can go and do it. For space in particular, for young people, I advise them to talk to UK SEDS, who are the UK students for the exploration and development of space. They're a really great organization for, for young people, and they help sort of signpost them to different career entry points. Beyond that, you've sort of just got to go and, and find the companies, come to events like this, talk to people, find the, the companies who do what you want to do and network. When I was young, I, I gave a similar talk when I was, I was about 21, and I always said, I had a slide that said, this is what I did. And I said, you've, you've got to seek out the opportunities and then don't turn them down. And, and for me, that's about what to do if you, if you want to go and find a job. There are space careers websites. You just got to go out there and, and look for them and be proactive. No one's going to come and knock on your door, but the jobs are out there. You've just got to go find them. I think there we have to stop. But thank you all so much. House lights up though, if we can do yeah, that. Yeah. Can hey! Yeah, okay. Uh, oh, wait, we'll do this. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Not that skilled. All right. Everybody wave. Everybody wave. Everybody wave. Yeah. <laughs> Very That's nice. it. You're looking fabulous. Yes. We did it. Thank you all. Thank you. Oh, yes. Yes, maybe we can. Yeah, books for sale. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great festival. Thank you.